This week we've got something a little different. I've personally never worked with either one of these. This is Weeping Mulberry and this comes from Mark. And Mark was driving through from British Columbia and he dropped off uh, three pieces and I actually traded him some butternut while he was here. So thanks Mark. This is <laughs> this is Weeping Mulberry and it is really light. So it is going to probably absorb a lot of resin. You see it's kind of really punky there. So this was covered in I believe anchor seal. I just trimmed the ends off and then wire brushed off the outside of it to get rid of any anchor seal so it's ready. And these are Douglas fir cones and these come from Craig who also lives in British Columbia. So the combination of these two makes us a British Columbia project. I These here I think are going to look really cool. I know here we bring the light over here. They're going to look really cool with the pearl pigments sitting on the top of these and they'll look just like flowers. So I plan on putting these in the bucket in this orientation all around this piece. I don't know exactly what this is going to be yet. I figured that I would cast it and then, uh, well, you know how we roll here. I'll figure that out as we go. First things first, I want to glue this in the bottom of this bucket here and then we can start filling it up with cones. I should mention that these were in my toaster oven to get rid of any pitch if there was any behind, but they're actually fairly clean compared to white pine cones, which are usually full of pitch. So weeping mulberry or mulberry period. Uh, again, I've never worked with that before. And if you have, please leave a comment down below. I did actually find it quite nice to turn. Uh, it was actually on the easier side. It was actually harder than I thought had anticipated it was going to be. Uh, the Douglas fir cones are more fragile than say the white pine ones. So uh, I had to tip this bucket over a number of times. I probably cut 95% of the footage out of here. I probably put these cones in and out of this bucket about 10 times before I was happy with, with what I got. So uh, people ask me why I don't use mold release. And one of the reasons for that is so that I can glue pieces like this in the bucket. And I know that I could clean off little areas and put the uh, the hot melt glue in there for that. But you know, in my mind, it's just, it's not needed. With a newish bucket like this, usually the castings will come out fairly easy. With a hammer anyway. All right, I've got those wedged in there as best I can. Uh, I don't want to put a weight on the top of this because if I, I'm going, to put, I'm going to put a lot of epoxy in here and if there's any leftover on the top hopefully we'll be able to incorporate that somehow in the piece. So I think what I'm going to do is just take some thin CA glue from Starbond and I'm just going to drizzle it down on top of these cones and hopefully that, that will be enough to lock them all together and they won't move when the epoxy goes in because this is glued down. Hopefully. There, while that glue is setting, let's mix up some resin. This week we're going to be using deep casting epoxy from Designer Epoxy. And I will remind you again about the deal that's in place right now. If you use code InlayGym at checkout, you receive 10% off your order, 5 free color bags, and free shipping within continental USA and Canada. Fantastic deal. If you've been waiting to try this epoxy, now is the time. As you've seen, we're going to be using some pearl red and some rich gold gold leaf. And of course, you can get these both at Designer Epoxy. First time ever using the, the uh, gold leaf. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, but let me know in the comments what you think about this week's piece. Pieces. Okay, hopefully those stay in place. Uh, this is probably going to be... Ooh, one of four, maybe. Yeah. All right, I'll mix uh, another one up and I'll bring it back when I'm done. This one was mixed the same as the last one. Well, we're getting some progress. One more. 
This is another liter and a half. So that is four and a half liters, and I'm going to give it one more because I know it's going to eat it up. Here's the last one. This will bring it to six liters. And this is a, a major overpour, so I'm hoping it doesn't thermal crack, but uh, get it here, fly. I'm certainly anticipating that maybe it will. <laughs> This is only supposed to be poured to, you know, four or five inches max. And I would have to guess, I actually won't guess. I'll get out the tape measure here in a second. That's sitting at seven and a half inches in depth, which is a lot. Hopefully these gold flakes seem to be sitting on the top. All right, well, that's it. I'm going to throw this in the pressure pot, and we'll see you in three days. Wish me luck, because I think we're going to need it. Oh, yeah, that's nice and heavy. Well, it is actually only two days after pouring this. And, I, you know, I knew this was going to be an overpour, and... I kind of suspected that it was going to crack, but you know, we have a way of dealing with that, so it's not a real big deal to me anymore. Uh, but yeah, we've got some thermal cracks here. As you can see, it's this piece has really soaked up a lot of that resin because it was sitting on top probably by that much. So that's how much it's absorbed. Uh, and again, I anticipated that. So, you know, we're off a little bit, but it's not too bad. But before we turn this, I definitely want to try and see if I can sort these cracks out. Anyway, we'll get this out of here and then we'll see what we're looking at. I don't intend on mounting this on the lathe. I'm hoping all the cracks are going to be exposed and we won't have to do that. Yeah, it's still a little soft, which I anticipated. But if I didn't uh, open this up and have a look at it, then we'd lose another day if I opened it up tomorrow and looked at it. Thermal cracks on the bottom. Well, I don't think there's any cracks on the sides. It's funny what, funny what it does. So far, so good. Yeah, I don't see any. So these on the bottom. Yeah, there's some in there. I just wore to see another one. Anyway, no big deal. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering when I was going to have this issue with deep cast again. And y'all, this is totally on me. This is... Uh, It's finished out at around six inches high. So that's two inches over the manufacturer's recommended depth of pour. And there was a lot of volume in there. So you can expect these things when you do that. So this was suggested by somebody in the comments uh, the last time that I kind of did this and put rice all around the outside of it. And, you know, I'm sorry, I can't remember who it was. But, you know, if you put a spacer in the bottom of the bucket, and you put the casting back inside the bucket, it because the bucket is tapered, it'll sit up a little bit and it should allow the resin to flow around the sides of it quite easy. So let's see if that works. May need something thicker than that. Yeah, that's pretty tight. Get something a little thicker than that. So that's a little thicker. Get my light in the way. Or get it so we can see what's going on. So hopefully that will work. Yep, 
there I can see a space all the way around so I think that that will really work for us for this pour we're going to be using arc cast and arc cast is a one to one so that makes it a little thicker than the two to ones uh, so it's best to warm your bottles up in say some warm water if you can and this was suggested last week because I wasn't real happy with the white color intensity that I got last week so this was suggested to use the liquid pigments and uh, we'll see when this piece is done if in fact it certainly is but at this stage it definitely looks pretty intense strong in color and that's what we're going for Well, I may have to mix up more, but uh, for now, let's leave that the way it is. You can see it galloping that down. Well, it's a change of plans. Uh, this will not fit in my vacuum chamber. It's too tall, and I don't want to cut the bucket down. So, you know what? I think that it's going to be fine. I'm going to throw this in the pressure pot, and this should be ready to go tomorrow. We'll see you then. Well, it's the next day, and as you can see, the level has dropped off. Uh, when I look down inside of there, it's down about a half inch. So that shouldn't be that big of a deal. Uh, let's get this out and see what we're dealing with. I always, I always find it interesting what the epoxy does. You just don't know. It's the weirdest thing sometimes. Well, anyway, as far as I can tell, everything's filled in on the bottom. All right, let's get some centers here. <clears throat> get it on the lathe. Some people might be wondering why I use the Forstner bit to drill down until I hit the wood. It's never a real good idea to have the drive center just sitting on epoxy. If you have the option, sometimes you don't have the option, but if you do have the option and you're going to turn it away anyway, then it's best to drill down to wood. That way the drive center, and <laughs> I don't know if you noticed it or not, but I was seeding that drive center into the, into the casting. And keep in mind that this stuff is now penetrated with epoxy so it's a lot harder than it was I, I never thought to measure the weight on this beforehand but it is considerably denser now so it has absorbed a lot of the epoxy and that's exactly what we're going for even though I mean deep cast is not meant to be a stabilizing resin or epoxy but because it's so thin when it goes into the pressure pot a lot of times it'll push that epoxy into the into the punky areas and that's one of the great things that I really like about deep cast so anyway I know what's going to be the bottom and I know what's going to be the top so I'm just whittling away excess material until we get to the profile that we're looking for Now this would have made a really nice hollow form and I know that we've done a lot of hollow forms recently so there's been some people asking that I do another bowl set so that's why I went in this direction this week and unfortunately we don't really see a lot of the flower look like I was talking about earlier because predominantly the cones are on the side of this piece. Uh, if you had cones sitting basically all facing upwards all across the top surface of this that's where you would definitely get a flower look and then of course you could have cut essentially a lid off of this taken another small casting out of this and then turn this into a lidded bowl and then have another bowl that that certainly was an option and I did think about that but I decided to go with a three bowl set here um, it's too bad that we don't get a lot of that flower look, but it is in spots throughout all three bowls in this piece. So uh, 
it's a, it's a really cool looking bowl set. And uh, please let me know in the comments what you think about that. And that way you can get your name entered into the next giveaway at 105,000 subscribers when we get there. I've also been getting a number of questions about the giveaways and it's predominantly the new people. So last week we did the 100,000 subscriber giveaway. And the next giveaway is going to be at 105,000. And we're already at 101,000. So that's awesome. And all I ask is that people leave a comment down below. So last week's video and every video forward until I hit 105,000 subscribers. Those are the videos that will count for the giveaway. Uh, I'm going to assume that Designer Epoxy is going to do another three gallon giveaway at 105. I haven't confirm that with gear girl yet but i'm i'm pretty sure that he's probably going to do that again and um so anyway all i ask is that you leave a comment down below and then that way you'll be entered into the draw and that helps me with the youtube algorithm along with that i thought i would touch on this as well i'm seeing a lot of people put designer epoxy and sandpaper on older videos and those older videos will not count for the next draw so there's there's really no point in you doing that. But, you know, if you want to leave a comment saying, oh, this is a, this is a great piece, Jim, that's appreciated. And YouTube will also see that. But the older videos with designer epoxy and sandpaper in them will not count for the next draw. So I know that there's been some confusion over that. But that's the way that the, uh, the draws work on the channel. Because there's no way that I can go through each and every one of these videos for every draw. I just... It would be just too too overwhelming to do that now that I've got quite an extensive video library. And along with that, I will also remind you that there is a playlist. So I have different playlists on my channel, hollow forms, resin pieces, bowl sets. It's, it's all kind of broken up. So if you see a specific type of turning that you like, natural inlays would be another one, natural wood pieces would be another one then you can go to the playlist on my channel and find more videos like that if you want to watch the same sort of content. And I'll thank you in advance for that. There, now that we have the public service announcements out of the way, <laughs> let's get back to the piece that's mounted on the lathe. So I've still got that little spacer that I put in there to get rid of. I've still got some ghosting on these little wings that you can see. So I'm going to whittle that away and expose uh, three sections of this so that the wood is coming through. And the best profile to do that in this case is actually a tulip shaped profile. So that's what's going to be on the outside big money bowl. That's It's going to be more or less tulip shaped. And we are using the number three Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems to eat this resin up and it's doing a fantastic job there you can see that wood starting to come through not a huge fan of the kind of ghosting resin over top of the wood effect so i would prefer to get that down so that we at least expose three webs on this kind of strange looking piece and these are great casting pieces so if you're if you're looking for something to cast look for something that's really oddly shaped like this and that way you'll have resin pockets all around the outside of it and then you know you can put cone in it or whatever your heart desires uh, the uh, sweet gum pods would, would would have been nice in this as well uh, so anyway we're just going to trim this piece up and i'm going to put a tenon on the very top of it the other thing too that i find interesting is a lot of that gold leaf was sitting on the top of this piece and since I've never worked with this, but I'm going to assume that this is the issue why it's not more incorporated in the resin pour. And that's the fact that I used the paddle mixer and it put a lot of air into the casting. And so that air grabbed that gold leaf and brought it to the surface. And that's where it sat. And that kind of cool, you know, at this point, I'm still wondering, you know, I like the fact that this white is sticking on the very top of this, but it's kind of taken away from it. So I'm not 100% sure if I want to leave it behind. And again, you've seen the thumbnail, so you know that it does get left behind. And 
after I got looking at it, I don't know, it looks like like cream and strawberries or <laughs> I don't know, vanilla ice cream and strawberries or, or something like that. So I decided to leave it on. I'm glad I did because I really like the look of this. The intention is to core this piece, as you know, and so I'm going to turn a tenon on the very top of this so that I can reverse this and then we can also use that tenon to turn a bottom onto the core and that way we can get another piece out of the large core as well. So at this stage, I'm finding the, the base of this is just a little bit too large. So that will get reduced in the future here. But, you know, at, at this point, I'm not too bad with it. There is one big crack that we need to fix here. And that's not a thermal crack. That's a crack in the, uh, in the actual wood itself. And, of course, this, this mulberry was right full of, of cracks. So, uh, <laughs> If the resin can't get to it, then it's not going to basically fill it in. And the last thing to do is to sand this to 60 grit so that we can get our waste block on the bottom of it. And that is a small little piece of cherry from Pepper Mill Production. And so need not going to waste that when it's actually almost the right size tenon that I like to go for. And again, I'll cover this. I like tenons because tenons are a lot stronger than mortises are. You've got a lot of time and money invested in this piece. It'll be a shame to see it come off the lathe with a failed mortise. All right, so it's ready for coring. This is the one-way coring system from oneway.ca if you're interested in getting one. I've got my Core Pro cutter in from Hunter Tool Systems. And as we know, it does a really good job going through this resin and wood. I'm going to have to do this unsupported for a little ways until I can get in. And then I'll be able to bring the tailstock up and hopefully nothing bad happens before then. Hopefully. I do like to leave those real-time clips in whenever I can to give you a sense of basically the noise and how slow the turning process is with, with epoxy and, and wood pieces like this. Um, I know my wife is some, she's in the past has comment, she was like, I can't believe that it's turning that slow. And like, yeah, you cannot be aggressive with epoxy. If you are, you're gonna get massive amounts of chip out. So slow and steady wins the race when you're dealing with that. So I like to leave those clips in there to give people a sense of how slow I'm going and how violent it can initially be. Because I think a lot of people get gun shy, if you wish, when they put a casting on the lathe and, it's, and it seems to be quite violent. And a lot of times that's how it is. <laughs> that's all there is to it. So once you're able to get tailstock support, then you can see that I'm a lot more aggressive than I was without it. And just using the air hose there to, to blow the shavings away because I can't extract the tool all the way. So then when you're getting near the end, it's good practice to turn the lathe down. Have your hand right on the stop switch. That way when it does break free, you can just turn the lathe off and, you know, things don't get bound up. And that's a decent sized core. So I'm now going to reverse that core with the tenon that I turned on the very top of it. And I'm going to turn a tenon on the bottom of this. 
this will get a glue block with my homemade face plates put on the bottom of it but until I can get the next piece out or the next core out I'm going to turn a very small tenon on the bottom of this. The cores I'm not so concerned about when it, when it comes to the big money bowl the outside bowl that's where I try to keep it as large as possible. There's some spots that need to be filled on this but other than that you know it's not too bad so that's a parting tool I'll we'll just cut in another tenon. We'll be able to reverse this and get the next core out. Now my cores here are pretty thick and that's by design. Uh, I've still got to put a glue block on the bottom of these and then reverse them outboard and you need that material there, that thickness to turn away to chew things up. I could have possibly snuck out another smaller core from this, but I think that it's always best to err on the side of caution. Uh, three is better than none. <laughs> so uh, that's just something to consider when you're, uh, if you're thinking about doing some coring. And I do really recommend getting coring rig. It will pay for itself in no time and put a lot of money back in your pocket. So it's a no brainer for me. And I just used the outside of the jaws. I expanded them open as far as I could to basically use it as a friction drive to put the waste block on the bottom of the largest core. <laughs> you gotta be really careful or you'll glue your hand to the bowl. Don't ask me how I know that. Yeah, I don't recommend doing that. Uh, over my extensive long inlay career, I've, I've welded my hands to many of bowls. And the thing is with CA glue, as it cures, it gets hot. And depending on where you've glued it to, it can be quite painful. So I should be wearing gloves here. That way, if you do happen to stick your hand to the bowl, you can just pull your hand out of the glove and, and you don't have to worry about it. But lots of small little cracks, and uh, these were deep inside the casting, so that's no fault of the epoxy. So for the big areas, we're going to use the UV resin from Designer Epoxy, and I'm just going to tint it white. Try not to make it too strong, because I'm worried about the UV light penetrating through the, uh, through the pigment, so we'll have to see how this goes. <laughs> yeah. One drop is probably lots. We'll hit this with the UV light for three minutes, possibly longer. We'll see how it goes. And uh, anyway, I'm going to do the same thing to this smaller one. And uh, we'll get the big bowl on the outboard end of the lathe, and get it trimmed up and to its first coat of finish. So the great thing about working on multiple projects like this at the same time is while one is say the CA glue is curing on it or the UV resin is curing on it then you can work on the other bowl. I had some concerns with the UV resin curing just because of how intense the pigment was. So what I did was I left my light sitting on top of both of them pieces that I filled with the the white UV resin while I was working on this bowl and I just kept changing around there was a couple little spots on the big bowl here up near the rim that needed to be filled but other than that it's pretty clean and this is an awesome looking thing at this stage and I'm like yeah I'm really glad that I went in this direction with it so I have two of these UV lights and again you can get these at designerepoxy.ca as well there's a couple other areas that needed to be filled so the great thing about having these is that I can just keep switching these bowls back and forth and you know sometimes I know that light might have sat on, on one of these bowls for a half hour. So the longer that that UV light has time to 
basically penetrate the casting of, or penetrate the, the UV resin, uh, the greater success it's going to have in curing it. It certainly worked this time around, but I can't help but think that if I had a mixed a really strong black, that that UV light may not have been able to penetrate that and cure that UV resin properly. But I'm curious to hear your results with UV resin and some of the difficulties that you've had while using it to uh, repair castings such as this. But I'm glad that I've got it in my inventory. It's allowed me to progress through my projects a lot faster than waiting for, you know, the two to three hour quick cure or the art, art cast or the pro series. Uh, UV resin, you know, literally within three minutes, you can be back in business and, and carrying on with your project. So it's definitely a great addition to anybody's workshop and I would highly recommend it as well. So as you watch me take this piece down and get it ready for sandpaper, I'll just cover kind of some stuff from last week. Uh, thanks to everybody that commented and congratulated me on the 100,000 subscriber uh, count. <laughs> I really do appreciate it. I've ordered my play button and that is in the mail. And I just actually got the notification from FedEx yesterday. So I will do an unboxing video when that arrives. But as far as the giveaway was last week, I was a little concerned that maybe it was going to be too busy. And I know a lot of people commented saying that, wow, when all the stuff was going in, that they thought the end result might be too busy. But since I've pretty much used all those materials, I kind of knew what the look was going to be. So I wasn't too concerned about it. <laughs> but uh, it certainly was in the back of my mind, like a lot of people uh, mentioned when they were watching the video. So here we're getting close to our finished wall thickness. Uh, I've still got to do some filling with some CA glue. And I believe there's also still some UV resin filling to do. So, you know, I'm not going to take that down to its finished dimension until that happens. Speaking of that, this is the thin CA glue. Since that pith is right in the very center of this, I figured that I would take a bunch of glue and dump it down on that just to make sure that it's good and solid. And there's what it looks like. And of course we can't forget the filling here with the UV resin on the white on the large bowl. I think in total there was about four spots or so that needed to be filled. And I left the UV light on there for about 10 minutes uh, before even thinking about turning it on. So I'm just going to do some more cleanup here with the Hercules. I did put a new cutter on the Hercules to take some final passes here. The other one just seemed to be fighting me a little bit. I typically find when the tools start to get really hot, that's when the cutter is probably getting to the end of its life. So, you know, if, if, if you're using the Hercules and you're having a hard time holding on to it, then it's probably time to change the cutter. So after I had all the major fixes done, I took another pass on the bowl on the inside and the outside and noticed that there were still some areas that need to be filled. So you'll see it down at the pith area. Uh, the pine cone, or sorry, not the fir cones needed a little bit of filling as well. I do find that as long as you're using a deep casting epoxy, I don't really see the need to stabilize these cones. You can certainly share your thoughts on that. It is important, this is probably the biggest thing, to run them through some sort of a heat source like the toaster oven. And I cooked mine at 250 for 20 minutes. And that will, you know, hopefully get any pitch that may be inside the cone out. And then that way you don't actually end up with any pitch coming out in your finished piece. So happy days, finally on the sanding. We're sanding from 60 to 800. And then, of course, once we're done sanding, and, and yes, I do prefer power sanding over hand sanding. I know that there's a lot of people that probably don't see the value in the power sanding, but it typically will always give you a better surface than hand sanding alone. Once the sanding's done, we're going to use the Triple E buffing compound from the Be All buffing system. 
And again, there are links in the description for all of the products or most of the products that you see here on my channel. So once we get done with the buffing, we'll clean this up with denatured alcohol and get it ready, finally get it ready for its first coat of finish. Well, that has been an eight hour turning session and I'm exhausted, but this I'm hoping is gonna look really cool with its first coat of finish. This is Waterlux Gloss. Well, what do you think of that? Did I make the right decision with leaving the white on the top? The icing? <laughs> Don't see a ton of the gold leaf in here. It is throughout the piece here and there, but I certainly thought that we would see a lot more. Cool how those webs come up between the, the cones and the resin. I like it. Especially this little detail here, with the thermal cracking. Very cool. All right, that's it for me on beat. I can't do any more. I'll we'll have to do the other two bowls tomorrow and get this to its second coat. See you then. So there's nothing new here. Uh, this is the next day using the Triple E buffing compound to level the finish, cut back any little lumps and bumps that may have gotten into the finish while the bowl is sitting there drying. Then once that's done, we'll use the denatured alcohol again to clean the surface. And this is very important. If you don't do that, then you know you, you may have some adhesion issues. So make sure that you always clean the surface with the denatured alcohol to get rid of that buffing compound. Good morning, this is the second coat of Waterlux Gloss. Well, there you go. Uh, it's going to need another coat for sure. Interesting wood too. Something I've never worked with, so that's cool. And it wasn't planned, but the pith on this piece is pretty much dead center of the uh, of the bowl, so that's awesome. All right, so anyway, we all will do the third coat the same way. And what I'm going to do with the other two bowls is I'll turn them. I might shoot a little bit of footage of it. And I'll show you with the coat of finish on them. Again, the coats will be applied to them the same way as this one. And uh, then we'll see when we're doing the bottoms. But anyway, I'll show you them when they're ready. Well, it's not too bad itself. The thing looks like a flower, doesn't it? Got some of that dug fur cone in there. Gold flake. I actually really like this detail. It's beautiful. Smallest one coming up. Well, it might be the coolest little core that we've done so far. Basically a bonus, but it's got all of those elements in there too. Very nice. All right, we'll see you when I'm doing the bottoms.
the bottom of these bowls was pretty dark and the reason for that is because of the end grain and the end grain absorbed a lot of the epoxy so it really darkened it up so the engraver is a good choice here and I used it on all three bowls. So I'd like to thank you all for watching this week's video and if you're new please hit that subscribe button and um, let's have a last little chat about this week's project and uh, yeah thank you all for for watching really appreciate it all right well let's just have a quick little chat about this week's project i really dig this look that mulberry is actually a really pretty wood i'm very happy with that awesome 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 now after i cut it off i noticed there's a couple of dull spots in it so this will get another coat of finish but it does have three coats on it now and of course there is the very bottom and to give you an idea of size i'll put the metric conversion up on on uh, the screen but it is nine and three quarters across and five and a half inches tall and it's anywhere i think between quarter inch to three eighths of an inch thickness maybe a little heavier in the base i uh, really really love this project and the look of this should look really nice when it's lit up. So I'll put some rotating footage up at the end like I usually do. So that's the big bowl. The largest core is seven and a quarter inches across and two and five eighths inches tall. And it's about the same, half inch, three eighths of an inch in thickness, a little thicker as it gets to the bottom. Uh, the cool thing about this set is all of the elements are in each one of the bowls, which is not typical when you do core, coring sets like this, with resin anyway. Usually the center one is nothing but burl. That's the way that I've been doing them anyway. But in this case, because you had those deep webs, it's throughout all the pieces, so that's really cool. I did the engraving on the very bottom of this one as well. Again, none of these have any finish. And our little guy, is four and three quarters across and an inch tall and had some issues getting all the details on the bottom but there they are and again it's so important to use that thin ca glue on all of your pith areas to seal those up and then once the finish goes on you shouldn't have any issues in the future but you are dealing with end grain that's the one thing about this piece it was all end grain and that's one of the knocks on end grain is that it can open up the pith if you leave it in your pieces, which you didn't really have a choice in this matter. So uh, regardless, this is a beautiful bowl set, and it is for sale. If you are interested, send me an email to spraggwoodturning at gmail.com, and I will disclose the price there. If you're curious, there's probably 12 hours of work in these three bowls, somewhere around there. So that will also give you an indication of the price. But anyway, it is for sale. Don't forget to put designer epoxy in the comments down below to be entered into the three gallon giveaway at 105,000 when we get there. And along with that, by putting a comment down below, you'll also be entered into my giveaway at 105,000 as well. I haven't talked to sandpaper.ca to see if they're interested in doing another giveaway. So don't worry, don't, don't need to put sandpaper in the comments down below until I let you know when and if they want to do another one. Um, next week we're going to be doing a basket case bowl and if you haven't been here before a basket case bowl are bowls that every wood turner has in his inventory and he doesn't really know he or she doesn't know what to do with and so what I'm going to do is uh, I've got a piece of walnut that's got a big knot in it and we're going to cut that out and do an inlay that we haven't done here before so that will be next week so I'll show you how to take a basket case and turn it into a beauty and sell it for a higher price at market. All right, well, that's it. Take care, stay safe. Don't forget the bell. Please share my videos with your friends. And uh, we'll see you next week. Take care.